Welcome, episode number 10 of Russell Folks. My name is Thomas Green. Find me on Twitter at NotThatTomGreen. Ten episodes in. Pretty big guest this week. Easily the toughest. I would say that if we threw him into a cage or a pit against the other guests we've had, like a handicap bout, if you will, he would destroy all of them single-handedly and still do like a cool dance or something at the end. Uh, Filthy Tom Lawler on the podcast, UFC middleweight fighter, former independent wrestler, all-around good dude. It's on the show this week. Had a very lovely chat about everything from Al Gante to current New Japan Pro Wrestling to the time he walked out to a weigh-in as the Shockmaster. So we'll get to that here in a second. Uh, first off, I do want to thank all of you who have supported the show. Ten episodes in, that's like two and a half months of content, hours upon hours. It's like I think it's about half a day's worth of audio we've recorded thus far. Um, I really think we're getting the point across that being uh, being a quote-unquote inside wrestling fan, a hardcore wrestling fan, we're not such a, an exclusive community anymore. Uh, and that's a good thing, I think, that it's... It's so widespread with the way technology is now, and then being able to find people who aren't who don't necessarily fit the mold of the, the insult stereotype that a lot of people think uh, hardcore wrestling fans are. So I think that's what we're doing with this show, and that's what we'll continue to do with this podcast as we move along. But I just wanted to thank you all for believing in this thing. Because I believe in you, if you believe in me. Uh, I met Billy Corgan once. He was a nice guy. Uh, he was at a, it was at one of his wrestling shows my friends were working on. And I, re- I remember shaking his hand. And uh, I asked, I said, hi, I'm Tom. How you doing? And he goes, eh, I'm angsty. Living the gimmick. Walks off. I'm like, you are a good dude. Whether he's a good dude or not, the fact is, he won me over with that comment on that day awkward pausing as i talk um before we go any further uh make sure if you're listening to this on itunes to rate the show five stars leave a review and more people will be allowed to not allowed to listen it's not like it's slave work but uh more people it'll be available for more like it'll be easier to search or something i don't know Something like that. If you aren't listening to I- on iTunes, get on iTunes, man. It's way of the future. Something. I don't know. I, I subscribe to, like, one podcast on iTunes. Uh, GoBayside.tumblr.com. It's awesome. It's like if Dave Meltzer grew a vagina and started reviewing Save the Bell episodes. Enough with the free plugs. Um, but if you don't want to pay for a plug, which that podcast did, and I was just giving it away. But if you do want to pay me, to show your stuff on the show. Uh, we have quite the loyal listenership. Way more people than I thought would be listening to me ramble on and talk to various folks. Um, so if you want your stuff out there, if you want people to know what you're doing, if you want people to know what your company's doing, talk to me. We'll set it up. Very cheap prices, very affordable prices. Uh, for sponsorship inquiries, email russellfolks at gmail.com and we'll get it all taken care of for you. Uh, I get to go do commentary again on Sunday for VWAA, Vanguard Wrestling All-Star Alliance, in Villa Park, Illinois. The venue just changed today, so uh, make sure you come out for that. Be a crazy show. Colt Cabana's there. Uh, Chuck Taylor will be there. The anarchist Eric Cannon. Uh, both those guys from Dragon Gate USA and PWG. Well, Cannon, not so much. Be a lot, a lot of name dudes there. Plus, some guys you might not know, but you will get to know and you will get to love. Um, but I will be there along with the very talented Kirby Alexander doing commentary. VWAAWrestling.com at VWAA on Twitter. Check them out. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. After the break, Filthy Tom Lawler and I chat about things. Shockmasters, El Gigante. Deep South Wrestling, and uh, DDT, the awesome fed in Japan. We can talk about campsite wrestling. It's awesome. Stay tuned. (laughs) 
filthy Tom Lawler on the line. Uh, Tom, as I ask every guest, uh, the first question, when did you start watching wrestling? Well, uh, I don't even know. I, I mean, I, I was young enough that I don't really remember. Probably, I don't know, probably four or five, maybe six, maybe even seven or eight. <laughs> Uh, so were you like a were you a WWF kid growing up or were you into the NWA or because there's I, I noticed a lot of people I ask were into the WWF but it's re- super regional. Yeah, it was. I grew up in in the Northeast in New England, um, so WWF was more I guess more accessible. But uh, for some reason, I I almost never missed WCW Saturday Night. Uh, once it got to about you know like 1990, 91, 92, somewhere in there, um, so that was just as big of a show to me at that time. And back then, I don't think Raw was even on. Um, so yeah, I, I got a, a healthy dose of both of them. So uh, around that time frame, then you got WCW. I, I want to ask because uh, he's personally one of my favorites. Were you a big El Gigante fan? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm not sure whether his run as uh, El Gigante or as Giant Gonzalez was better, um, but yeah, a huge, huge fan of his, uh, especially when he was teaming with Brian Pillman. Um, that's seemingly all I all I remember from his WCW run. Uh, I just I remember just, uh, uh, about the uh, WCW run. He had this uh, this great promo, like he was gonna wrestle Ric Flair at some house shows, and he didn't know any English. But they coached him to just say, I want Z belt over and over and over again. And it was beautiful. But yeah, the dude was a, flash, a fashion player. Like, whether it be the flesh colored suit <laughs> or the sweet headband that he wore in WCW, he was the, uh, he was the man. But, uh, he, yeah, he was pretty awesome. He's kind of, um, I don't know, I guess the great Kali has probably taken over uh, a similar role nowadays. True, but. Like, Kali, I, I love Kali. I think he's the most adorable wrestler in the world. Like, they're, the, the, the the secret detective stuff they're doing with him right now, I think, is literally adorable. Like, I think he's like a puppy dog. I don't know. There was something, I don't know. There was something about El Gigante, Giant Gonzalez. I don't know. Maybe it was the fact that I, like, Harvey Whippleman, I think, made him in the WWF. Because, uh. because it was literally a, it was like a used car salesman. Who just happened to own a giant? Yeah. So, so uh, did you get to experience any like live wrestling when you were uh, when you were younger? Because around that time, like like when Raw eventually started up, I know they started running a lot of small towns in the Northeast for uh, those TV tapings. No, uh, I mean I went to a few house shows uh, when I was a kid. Um, I would go, but my dad would take me. But uh, you know that I don't remember them being around here that much. Uh, and back then, you know, I mean, people like if you're young now, you don't realize back then uh, you didn't have all this information just at your fingertips. Like you got it in maybe the newspaper or, um, you know, maybe when on the syndicated show on the weekend, it threw up a flash of where they're going to be next and, and how to get tickets and stuff. So it wasn't like, you know, if you missed that opportunity of seeing it on TV, you might not even know the show was going on. Oh, definitely. I think. Kids growing up these days are so spoiled when it comes to like wrestling information, let alone all this other like special junk going on, like the news or like yeah. real technical technological advances. But yeah, like all you have to do is pick up your phone and oh hey, the WWE will be two feet from me tomorrow or something. Yeah. Whereas back then, you know, if you missed the Undertaker, especially if you lived in a small town and it was like one of the little high school gyms they ran, you didn't mm. get to see him for a year and a half. So, uh, so yeah, um, so, uh, like you, you were, I, I wanted to ask this because, uh, of my own personal experience in school, uh, you amateur wrestled growing up, right? Uh, or, or was yeah, that, well, when I was, when I got to high school, so not when okay. I was young. Probably. Yeah. That's about the time range I was alluding to because, uh, like, were you still into wrestling at that point or was that the thing like, oh, that yeah, was what I did when I was younger, and then you got back into it. No, I think uh, basically uh, professional wrestling is the reason why I started amateur wrestling, and I had never even like seen a match uh, before I stepped into the amateur wrestling room. So that was like before you know the age of fourteen. I had no clue what a real wrestling match looked like. 
Uh, it was all like pro wrestling in my mind. So, I mean, I knew it was obviously not the same thing, but, um, you know, I wasn't like, I, I had no exposure to it. So you weren't one of those kids that first day on the mat, you're throwing around like, you know, the sharpshooter and the torture rat. <laughs> I, I would have been if I could have completed it, but uh, <laughs> I still nowadays sometimes uh, in my training I'll, I'll try to go for a sharpshooter or Boston Crab or you know figure four leg lock or something. Uh, yeah, the reason why I asked is because like when I when I was in school, like middle school, high school, uh, if like at least at my school, if if like the amateur wrestlers found out you were into wrestling or into pro wrestling or uh, you were you know what you were talking about it. Uh, at least in my experience, you would have someone chiming in. Oh, well, what, that, that's fake, man. What I do, when you do it's real, blah, da, 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 da. You get the whole fake and real thing. But was that, like, was that something you had to deal with, with with them or even anyone else in school was the whole, oh, don't you know it's fake deal? Uh, no, but, I mean, by that time, uh, by the time I was in high school, my, I mean, that was like the beginning pretty much of that. So it was cool to be a wrestling fan. You know, there was plenty of kids walking around there, stone cold shirts, uh, f- giving the double bird, and you know, the Rock was uh, blowing up big time back then. So it was like it was cool to to like pro wrestling. So uh, yeah, I never encountered that. Yeah, that was a, that was a, at least for like us wrestling fans was a cool period because before then it was kind of like you had your couple wrestling fans at every school, and everyone knew who you were. And then when, like, Austin, The Rock, and EWO all blew up, then everyone, if they didn't want to be your friend, they at least wanted to, oh, what happened on Nitro last night? Or what did Austin do? Did he throw the belt off the river? Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so, like, you kind of, you didn't become necessarily the cool kid, but you became someone people would talk to about your hobby, you know? Yeah, I, I was, uh, I was definitely not the cool kid, so... <laughs> Uh, and th- that didn't transform me into it either. So. <laughs> now, uh, now something I, I wanted to bring up. I, I, I don't think it's like a fact to hide necessarily, but I also don't think it's a fact that uh, it's, it's out there. But uh, you were an independent wrestler, and there's footage of this on YouTube. Uh, if anyone wants to go seek this out, um, it's, it's easy to find. Just type in Tom Lawler Wrestling into YouTube, and at least one tag match you had pops up uh, yeah there's i think there's a few uh that are on there and i mean there's plenty more that are missing so um yeah I, I mean i wish i had all of them on tape but unfortunately i don't so like how did you get into the wild and wonderful world of independent wrestling uh i mean i just basically uh once i graduated college i went to a um uh, there was like a pro wrestling school that had opened uh, in Orlando, Florida, and I, you know, I went to it to check it out, and just uh, went from there. So, I mean, basically, looked on the internet, walked into a place, and and started getting into it. I mean, I it was something that I had wanted to do, obviously, for for a very long time. So, uh, you know, I just decided to pursue that avenue the quickest uh, way that I could. So, now were you training MMA or jujitsu or anything at the same time, or was it just the deal where I'm going to do this now and then this later? Or? Yeah, I was uh, – uh, yeah, I pretty much stopped. I mean I was coaching uh, high school and stuff like that. So I um, I had stopped uh, you know, doing any MMA training or anything like that, but I was still doing some amateur wrestling um, and then also training pro wrestling. So, so like – so I, I couldn't really find a time. Like how long were you wrestling before you know, things took off with your MMA career? Um, I was, I, I want to say a year and a half, maybe two years, somewhere al- along those lines. Uh, it wasn't like a very long career. Uh, I had a, my first match within a few months, I think, uh, maybe, you know, within the first, I don't know, three or four months, maybe, maybe five months, some, somewhere around there. Um, and, you know, then I then kept up with that for, I think, about a year and a half or maybe two years uh, before I... Uh, started doing some MMA stuff again. So, uh, around, oh, around that period, uh, 
you know, I, I believe it's around the time TNA started running the Impact Zone in Orlando. And I know, uh, at least in the match I found, uh, you were wrestling with guys like Lex Lovett and Buck Quartermain, who yeah. were we were doing those tapings, at least at first. Like, yeah. was, that, was that ever a thing you looked into doing, or was it just, I'm doing this wrestling thing for fun, and these guys can do it for a career over here, or... Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know, uh, maybe nobody that I knew had an in at TNA, um, cause they were running Impact Zone, but I wasn't, I didn't go that much, so I'm really not sure, um, what the deal was back then. <laughs> I don't know if I just, like, didn't, didn't think about it as, like, a viable, uh, making a viable living there, or, uh, you know, I'm not really sure. I'd have to go back and look at the, the time frames and stuff. Um, cause I'm not sure that they were running, I'm, I'm not sure how they how much they were running. It was maybe like once a month at that time and they would tape a bunch of shows. Um, so maybe that's the reason why, but, uh, yeah, I, I never, um, I guess I d- didn't have an in there more than anything else. Now the, the one match I, I watched and I don't want to be like, Oh, Hey Tom, here's a bunch of compliments. Uh-huh. But, uh, but, uh, what I, what I liked is, like, when you see an amateur wrestler or an, MMA, or an MMA fighter who trains in pro wrestling that does it, they always do, like, the same, you know, quote-unquote shooter moves. And yeah. Like, the match I saw, you were just another wrestler, which I thought was really cool. But uh, I just wanted to throw that out because I, I can't, like, when MMA fighters do wrestling, yeah, it's it makes sense that they would do just, you know, they would do a lot of MMA mm-hmm. stuff, but... If they're if in, if everything were real and you know and, and castle shot fireworks and all that fictional fun stuff, uh, you know they would at least learn some pro wrestling technique. And it seems like when a lot of the MMA shooter types, uh, like like Kid Shamrock was a perfect example of uh. like kind of how I. Like, he did, like, a Rana and stuff, so at least it looked yeah. like he, quote-unquote, trained pro wrestling. Whereas, especially in Japan, a lot of guys. But I also think that was maybe Anoki wanting guys to, oh, it's got to look real, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. You know. I mean, and there, there's such a, a contrast in the two different styles that you'll see, too, between uh, Japan and the U.S., even as far as, um, you know, guys that are in, like, a shooter gimmick go. Because, I mean, you can't compare... Uh, like the work of like someone like Minoru Suzuki to what Brock Lesnar is doing, you know, there's, there's something, um, there's something in the culture that makes it different um, and and just viewed differently. But yeah, when I was, when I was doing pro wrestling stuff, uh, I mean, that was my, I I didn't really want to do any like shooter style (laughs) moves per se. I mean, I'm a pro wrestling fan, you know, I just imagine like that would have ruined the the fun, you know, like, you're just you're doing this one completely separate thing, and it's like you know, I I want to eat. I like I'm a really big fan of steak, but I just want to eat dessert right now. Why are yeah. you throwing steak into my ice cream? Yeah. Ah, uh, but yeah. Uh, so so going into the whole like shooters and pro wrestling thing, like, I imagine doing indies, you didn't cut like a ton of promos, but I imagine you cut at least a few. And uh, is like I wanted to bring it up because I know like guys like I brought up Ken Shamrock. He yeah. had, uh, like, his promo style in MMA was almost better than it was in wrestling because in mm-hmm. wrestling he just, rah, 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 rah. Whereas in MMA, like, the stuff with Tito Ortiz, like, if you were cutting those promos on Raw, you know, maybe, you know, he, he did really well in the WWF, yeah. but he didn't, he wasn't top dog. Maybe if he were that guy in wrestling, maybe he would have gone a little further. Uh, it, like, I, I wanted to ask, like, like cut like talking for MMA versus wrestling like for you how did it vary uh well you have a lot <laughs> you have a lot more opportunities to talk uh with MMA because of the just the time of an interview you know um like so so this for example uh, how often does somebody in the pro wrestling world get to you know talk for you know really over a minute or two or you know 5 minutes 10 minutes unless you're one of the top guys so um you know, I, I guess I just have more access to different outlets and more time as far as MMA goes. So you can kind of relax a little and, uh, you know, not feel like rushed and like you have to put on a show for a promo. Yeah, now, uh, and I, I, I don't want to bring up a lot of MMA, but one other MMA question before the big one we talked about towards the end. Uh, 
in your opinion, uh, who are like I, I I know I get I know it's 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 very much not a work and all that, mm-hmm. but uh, who in your opinion are the best quote unquote promo guys in oh. the fighting game right now? Well, I mean, do you want like guys that I think are putting on or doing promos or either? However, you want to answer that, man. Uh, I mean, the best guys to listen to. It's you know some of it. Some of these guys are putting up an act, and some of them aren't. But I mean, uh, definitely Chael Sonnen. I mean, that's like the number one uh, person you would you would look at and say that uh, you know they're the most fun to to hear from out of any of the fighters. Uh, the Diaz brothers, both of them are amazing to listen to. Even you know, and they're not doing promos; they're just uh, you know on another planet as far as their personalities go. Uh, you know, I don't. Those guys are. Pretty much the first ones that comes to mind. Uh, first ones that come to mind. Vanderlei Silva, I like hearing from as well because I can't understand anything <laughs> they say. It's uh, it's pretty funny for me. Uh, now, uh, and that, that bring you brought up Chill's name. I wanted to bring up something. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm not trying to stir anything up, but I just wanted your honest opinion on uh, uh Chill's kind of become known as like the pro wrestling guy in MMA, yeah. so to speak. Um, how, how do you think about? Because I, I see Chell cutting a, like a wrestling promo or whatever, and you know he's buddies with Steve Austin, yada yada yada. Yeah. And then you're over here dressed up as like Hulk Hogan and the Shockmaster. Like I'm almost thinking like you know, send some of that, some of those vibes Tom Lawler's way because you're, you're out there actually, you know, giving. Pro- I mean, the Shockmaster is is an obscure thing to to give props to, you know. Well, I'm hoping that he contacts me, uh, tugboat slash typhoon. Uh, contacts me and you know maybe I can start hanging out with him if uh, Chell's hanging out with Stone Cold. I think That'd he lives cool. down there towards you because I think his son was training at FCW for a while to be a ref. Oh well, I'm in I'm in uh, I live in Rhode Island currently. Okay, then I might yeah then I. I, I don't, if I don't he's up that. here, I'd be yeah. very, very surprised. Yeah, no, <laughs> I, never mind. I'm an idiot. I thought you were down in Florida, but uh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he's currently. Uh, down in Florida, because I have a buddy down there who's who's doing some stuff, and he says he sees tugboat around everywhere. Really? So yeah, a lot of those guys are in Tampa. A lot of the uh, old wrestlers live in Tampa, or you know, uh, other parts around that area. So it doesn't surprise me. I mean, there's a lot that are in Orlando as well, and I'm sure other parts of Florida. Now, uh, I was going to save it till the end, but it's going to it kind of naturally came up at the Shockmaster thing. For people who don't know, you had a weigh in. Uh, I believe it was last year. You dressed up as the Shockmaster and did the full entrance, including the fantastic trip onto the stage. Like, how did this come about? Um, uh, I had thought about doing it uh, in the past, and then uh, it was. I remember I was at a show and I was talking to Joe Silva, and he was asking me something about the uh, the entrances, and I told him that I had planned to do the shock master, but like, I, I think I couldn't find any of the stuff for it. So I changed my mind. And, um, and he was like, Oh yeah, that, you know, that'd be good. So basically I think it was the next fight. I did the shock master, but the, you know, the most amazing thing about the whole situation is if you watch it, this is like the first time I ever remember not, not having the weigh-ins on a raised platform. So normally you walk out of a curtain and then you have to walk upstairs and onto the platform. For some reason at these weigh-ins, that wasn't there. So I walked right out of the curtain and it was like a perfect place for me to trip and fall. Because in my head, I, there, I was having a dilemma over like, should I trip and fall as soon as I walk out of the curtain or should I wait till I make it up onto the stage? But, um, you know, they took that all that guesswork out and it, it couldn't have worked out better for me. Now, uh, like, what was the reaction, like, after you got off? Because I know, like, I was online, and I had one friend who texted me. He's like, oh, Tom Lawler did the Shockmaster thing. And I go home, and I immediately look it up. And I think, like, Meltzer and maybe Ariel Hawani recognized what you were doing. Uh But it seemed like everyone else online, like, all the MMA reporters, like, he's just wearing a Stormtrooper helmet. What's he doing? Yeah. A lot of people thought I had tripped on purpose or uh, tripped on accident, too. I got a lot of messages from people that had no clue what it was and, like, are you okay? Oh my God! What, did you trip on purpose, or was it a was it a joke? And uh, you know, then I, I think even Fuel TV and the UFC uh, put out a short video uh, titled "Shock It to Me" that had uh, 
you know, had that entrance. So that helped out a little bit when trying to explain it to people. Now, uh, like I noticed when you came out, Joe Rogan said something like, he's going to shock the world. Did you feed that line to him or did he actually know what the heck you were doing? No, nah, we, we gave that to him. We uh, warned him in the, uh, <laughs> in the in the back room previously, but he didn't know. I mean, he didn't know. Ariel Hawani knew um, for sure because – and uh, I think uh, Wei Ting from um, – uh, what is it? The Fight uh, – they were yeah. on the Fight Network, but I mean, with the law. Yeah, the law and review uh, away and all that fun stuff. Yeah, I'm not, and I mean, he, I know he was there. Maybe John Pollock, if he was there as well. Um, but I'm sure those guys knew what it was. I remember seeing Ariel right away uh, afterwards. So, uh, you know, the three people that were there that knew, that's enough for me to be happy about it. Now, uh, you, you've done the Hogan deal. You've done the Shockmaster deal. Is there anyone else in, in, in pro wrestling you're wanting to do it, like a weigh-in or even an entrance or something that you haven't gotten to do yet? I mean, there's a lot that I would like to do, but, uh, I mean, realistically, I never know how many fights I'm going to have in the future, so I kind of have to be real picky and choosy. And, I, you know, part of me is trying to get away from that um, the pro wrestling gimmick where I'm just stealing other people's ideas. Uh, I'm trying to... I don't know, maybe be a little bit more original with my ideas in the future, but I doubt that's going to happen. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but, I, but I'm trying to move away a little bit from the pro wrestling stuff. Now, uh, you had a fight in Canada a few years back, and Dave Meltzer was saying at the time, I, b I believe it was you, you wanted to come out to the Mountie theme song? Uh, yeah, I think that had been uh, thrown around, <laughs> uh, thrown around at least in my mind or or in public. Um, I that uh, a couple times that's been brought up, uh, actually. Um, but you know, I don't know. Canada is a, a strange crowd because uh, you know, obviously, I'm I'm from the U.S., so I kind of like want to play that angle up a little bit. But I really like the Canadian fans, so I really don't want to do anything to piss them off because uh, I really think that they are I mean, maybe the best crowd for MMA in the whole world. So, um, so yeah, and I doubt I'll do the Mountie in the future. I'm not a big Rougeau fan. Oh, at least, even the fabulous Rougeaus? Come on. No. American boys. Yeah, that was – now, uh, John Pollock and I had talked about me coming out to that song the week of the fight um, for uh, a fight I had in November that was in Canada. So – uh, that one was thrown around there as well. So, oh, that would have been epic, and amazing. Uh, like at the least in my my opinion, like the best wrestling theme song of all time. <laughs> like for for guys who didn't have like a major run, the 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 fact that that's one of the songs always thrown around when people are like talking about you know cheesy or awesome theme songs online, it says how great it was. Jimmy Hart's Jimmy Hart's a freaking man. Uh, <laughs> That one, I would also have to put up uh, William Regal's Man's Man theme as one of the top ones of all time, in my opinion. Uh, did you see, uh, I think a year ago they were in England, and he was doing a match for like Superstars or some show that yeah. like five people watch, and uh, they just played the song in like, the middle of his entrance. Yeah. And he looks it up to the sky, and he's like, good one. He was Which wrestling uh, Daniel Bryan yes. in that match. I remember seeing that. That, that was that was fantastic. Uh, yeah, the, the great, but yeah, the great old wrestling theme songs that are so che like guys today don't get those like really awesome cheesy themes. Now it's kind of uh, just one band does all of them and they all sound exactly the same. Kind of a there, um, there are some pretty good themes in NXT. I think that are actually better than the ones that are used in WWE. So yeah, they're uh, out there. Like uh. uh Biggie Langston's song in NXT, I think, blows away the song they're using on TV right now. It kills me they replaced it. And, uh, uh, and Bray Wyatt's song. Like, that's that. so perfect. Yeah. So perfect. And Emma's song, too. I can't oh, my goodness. Song. Okay, there, did you see the clip? There was a house show clip that went up on YouTube last week. Uh, uh, they were in West Virginia, and they had they did the deal where John Cena sang uh, uh, Country Roads at the end of the show with Daniel Bryan and Kane and... Uh, like they, he was holding the tag belts hostage. If Daniel mm -hmm. Bryan didn't sing the song, and he's like, "No, I won't do it." And John Cena's like, "Fine, do the Emma dance." So they mm -hmm. played the music, and Daniel Bryan did the Emma dance. 
And no, I haven't seen it. I'll have to check that out. Oh, it's it's great. Hopefully, it's still up because they're kind of badgers she, about getting stuff down. Is she on the road with? Uh, yeah, her and, uh, her and Paige are on. Uh, they're they're not on TV, but they're yeah. like they have like six or seven NXT guys. I know. Uh, uh, his name is his name's escaping. He used to wrestle Sterling James Keenan. Uh, uh, Corey, Corey Graves. Graves. Yeah, Corey Graves is on the road. And Bray Wyatt's on the Bray Wyatt's like winning every every match really? yeah good so. i'm i'm i, I will kind of break my heart if they call him up by himself because i love brody and uh rowan with him so much but uh i'm i'm not impressed with rowan at all <laughs> like, like rowan by himself yeah i think is terrible but rowan with that whole package because he looks pretty much like sloth lives in the mountains uh. and starts chopping down trees like like i but uh yeah, and like the two girls and uh, and Owen Pox on the road, uh, Adrian Neville. Oh, okay, yeah. Because I know him and Sin Cara would do, were doing tag matches against, I think, like 3MB or something. This uh-huh. weekend, which, yeah, that's a whole other tangent. Like, I love the heck out of Heath Slater. I think he's one of the most underrated guys on the roster. But, uh, but yeah, like, so, like, who, like, who else are you digging from the next team right now? Um,. Not Bo Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if there's one guy that I really could, like, you're talking about a, one person that you could pick that when he comes on, you want to change the channel. I think it would be him. Um, but pretty much everyone else. I mean, I really look forward to that show every week. Uh, I checked last week and it was, they were a little slow getting it up on Hulu on uh, Hulu Plus. I was pretty, pretty pissed off. Um, but yeah, that's that's probably my favorite show uh, on a consistent basis to watch. So. Uh, pretty much anybody except for Bo Dallas. Like, I think the thing that kills me about Bo Dallas is like he's been down there seemingly like a decade, and he has a suplex, and that's it. And I'm not saying I need a ton of moves from a guy, but literally he's like he's wrestling in 1985. Yeah. And he looks like a teenage girl. Yeah. Like he looks yeah. like Taylor Lautner's daughter. Yeah. I mean, his physique is not a. Uh... Not befitting of like a, a main event star or even I, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> like like it would kinda work if he kind of if he did like a one, two, three kid type of deal. Mm-hmm. But the fact that his finish is a throw and he's wrestling guys who are literally look like adults compared to him as a child. Like he did it to Wade Barrett a few weeks ago and or mm-hmm. it was back when he first came in and yeah, I know there's like momentum and such if this were all real, but I'm thinking like, oh that's a little hokey. But, uh, yeah, yeah he, I'll, I'll go ahead. he needs to me, he just needs like a whole, if they're going to do anything with him, they need to repackage him. They should, I mean, they should just stick him with Bray Wyatt. They should stick him with his brother. Oh, that's easy peasy. Cause everything yeah. Bray is good at, Bo isn't good at. Yeah. So, and I think Bo Wyatt sounds a heck of a lot less porn story than Bo Dallas. Mm. Like, I mean, I'm expecting the dude to be like a pizza man walking to the door. Uh-huh. But, uh, but yeah, like, uh, yeah, that's the, I love that show because it's so simple. Like they don't they don't seem to throw in all the effort into it that they do Raw, and then Raw gets very. It just it seems like they think too much with like the main shows, whereas NXT, here, oh here's a lineup, let's just throw it on TV, and it, yeah. they, they have like two storylines running through it. Uh, did you see uh, Cassius Ono and William Regal a few weeks ago? Yeah, I did. Yeah, like, yeah, I did. That thing, uh, I I loved it. You know what's really – it's such a small thing to bother me, but uh, the fact they gave Barrett like an elbow as a finisher and now uh, Ono is like not using him as much. I mean barely, really. They switched his finisher to some sort of uh, – it's like an STF with a cravat. Um, yeah, he was uh, – it was the hangman's clutch because he used to uh, – I live in Indiana. He used to do a lot of shows for Ian Rotten around here. Mm-hmm. That was his finish then, but uh, – but yeah, like it, that, mid south, uh, yeah, or not? W mid south, yeah, uh, yeah. That was I, a million trillion Ian Rotten shows that I skipped school for in high school. Uh-huh. But uh, but no, like yeah, that that's, that does stink. So, yeah, that was the elbow was pretty much his thing. And then Wade Barrett needs a new finisher because Fireman's Carry isn't working for him. And, yeah, uh, nothing is really. If you look at <laughs> As far as like a, from a booking standpoint, I mean, he he was looking pretty strong a few years ago, back when the Nexus was going. Now, I mean, he's just like he's low on the totem pole. Like last, like t- like last night on TV, he 
he was in a little. He didn't even get audio for his little insert. It was go watch him on the app talk about the Miz. Oh yeah, I was gonna say I don't even remember seeing him, but yeah, like he was on the uh, screen for maybe three seconds during uh, like that really really long seeming Miz match with I think I think it was Heath Slater actually. So yeah, the three man band could have three man band got on TV, but Wade Barrett, the Intercontinental Champion, couldn't. Uh, there's a lot of guys like Barrett though who. Like, it seems like they, they put, they give him the ball, and then they get to, like, yeah, like, Antonio Cesaro kills me. Yeah. What, what is it, last week, they let him cut a little promo, then they throw him in a match with Orton and have him job, and then job him out again on Monday. In case you didn't see it on Wednesday, <laughs> we're going to do it again Monday. And, and then I hate when they do that, because it's, like, if you, if you want people to know he's... Uh, like underneath Randy Orton, just do it on the Monday show. Yeah, you know, don't waste our time because they do that like on SmackDown every week. They, I think they assume that nobody that watches SmackDown watches Raw uh-huh. because at least the top two matches get rematched in like two minute matches. You know, like like the uh, the main event of SmackDown every week is like hour two coming up next. Dolph Ziggler against whoever, mm-hmm. and they get three minutes. So, I mean, a few years back, uh, I mean SmackDown was where it was at for quality wrestling i mean back when angle and and those guys were still uh floating around oh, totally. totally like uh, uh, those uh the smackdown six era with like the he who shall angle. not be named and yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> angle and him and ray and edge right is that yeah uh, angle uh benoit uh chavo eddie uh, uh yeah like that those six pretty much just wrestled each other for like three months and you didn't really have to give them a whole lot. It's just, go wrestle for a while. Okay, yeah. cool. Like, I remember Edge and Eddie had, like, this killer no DQ match. It was essentially a ladder match with nothing above the ring. That was awesome. And, yeah, yeah, pretty much just put those two into any combo. And then I remember a few years back, it was, like, 2009, I think, right when Punk was about ready to turn heel. Like, they kind of got some of that mojo going again with, like, it was like Punk and Umaga had a really good feud, and then they had like all the all the quote unquote work rate guys on SmackDown, mm-hmm. and then I think they switched to another channel, so Triple H had to go over and beat everybody, and and then I think him and Jeff Hardy did their deal. I don't know. I kind of uh, during that time period, I think I was like, I don't think I was watching at all, because uh, there's a couple of years there where uh, after I stopped doing pro wrestling i was kind of like screw this i'm not watching it <laughs> i had a bad taste in my mouth so i think there was like a two or three year period there and i think that's that's right in there so i missed all that stuff so was it just, did you have like a specific incident that made wrestling like put a bad taste in your mouth or was it just i'm done with this i'm over it uh, clean break i mean i guess if you don't know what you're getting into when you get into it you can kind of you know be left with a bad taste in your mouth. But I mean, it's, it's like an entertainment business, you know, there's virtually no, um, no like right way that you can go up through a system and, and turn out, uh, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily mean if you work harder at it that, you know, it pays off in the end, which I guess that's kind of, uh, kind of something that turns me off to it a little bit. Yeah. Like I have friends who are, uh, who are independent wrestlers around this region who, uh, who I'm, I'm they, they aren't the best in the world, but I think they're pretty darn good. Who have mm-hmm. gotten opportunities? They've gone to like Chikara and yeah, uh, they I, they even wrestled for Ian Rotten last year, mm-hmm. which was a trip amongst itself. I got to experience that, but uh, no, like that's a frustration they always have. Is no matter how good I am, the fact is, unless I know so and so, so and so, and so and so, I'm not going to get beyond this point. You know, which, yeah, which. I, that's, that's, I couldn't imagine living like that every day, knowing that my dream, no matter how good I get at this profession, you know, there's a there's a 99% chance I'm not going to get beyond this point, no matter how good I am. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I I, uh, I would got sent up to uh, Deep South, actually, for a tryout, like a week-long tryout. Um, and then when I went back home, you know, I was told, like, oh, oh Call me next week. Contact me next week. We'll talk about what we can do in the future. Well, I mean, after like ten calls and no answer, or no return or anything, you know, then maybe two weeks later, I got a call back from uh, 
Gerald Briscoe saying like, oh, you know, we just want you to work on some stuff, this and that, and then we'll call you back in the future. And uh, I, I didn't, never thought that call was actually going to come, you know, because I, you know, I called Bill DeMott for a week and, you know, heard nothing back from him. So I was like, well, well, you know, this probably isn't going to work out. And uh, then after I had already gone back to doing some MMA stuff, uh, I got a call from uh, Simon Dean, who had, I guess he had taken over Tommy Dreamer's like spot in the office and, uh, you know, said they're going to set something up in the future, but that didn't work out either. So that that was the uh, end of my process with pro wrestling. So, so going back a step in this, because I'm really interested in this now, because there are a million billion stories about Deep South out there. Mm. Um, like, like how, like how did you enter the system? Was it was it like a Gerald Briscoe who saw you? Like, oh, hey, he uh, has wrestling experience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's from Florida as well, um, but he had I had done like extra work at a house show in Orlando and met him there. And, uh, and he set it up and, you know, he knew that I had wrestled and stuff. So he set it up for, uh, for deep South. And then I was up there, you know, I can't really tell you a whole lot about the experience cause I was only up there for like the week long tryout. But I mean, I, I remember a lot of the stuff and I'm sure I don't remember even more of it. <laughs> so, but, uh, I just, I wanted to ask a couple questions about deep South. Cause like, like I said, there are a million stories out about the environment. So mm-hmm. like you were just, like you said, you were just a guest for a week. Yeah. Uh, because of that, did you like? You know, I'm sure you've heard the stories about guys who have been worked out beyond all possible belief down there. Like, yeah. was, what, like, do you think maybe they took it easier on you guys because you were guests, or were you just thrown right in? No, I wasn't. Uh, I was there with all the guys who were under contract for the week, so it wasn't like I was with a bunch of other guys uh, that were brought up there for like a camp. Like I, I was, uh, I was with all the guys who were under contract. And some, I mean, some of them are in the, you know, WWE now. So, 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 so I was doing whatever they were doing too. Which I, some of the guys were complaining about it, about the work. Uh, but I mean, I wasn't. <laughs> you know, I was happy to be there. I was trying to outrun everyone. I was trying to do all the exercises better and faster than everyone else. You know. So, like, because uh, like when you hear guys talk about Deep South now, it seems to be, like, a clear divide in the middle. Either, oh, yeah, they worked us out hard and it was tough, but whatever, wrestling's tough. And then there are these guys over here who are like, yeah, so-and-so was a big old jerk who hated everybody and wanted to kill us all. Like well, so, that, okay. that might be true uh, if you take personalities into account, but the physical hard work, I, I don't see any, I didn't see anything wrong with it. I mean, was it? We'd be in there for two or three hours at a time, which kind of sucks. But I mean, that's what you're getting paid to do. You're getting paid to work out. You're getting paid to um, to do pro wrestling. So what else are you gonna do? Sit at home all day? I mean, get in there and work out. Yeah, it just it like to the, the average person at home. That's and obviously, like you said, some people there. That's what it seems like. Is these guys are getting paid to wrestle yeah. for a living. I would want to be in the best possible shape that I could be in uh, for that job. If I'm getting paid to wrestle and be in front of you know be in front of millions of people in little small underwear, I'm gonna be working my hardest to make sure that I look good. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's just I, I like. There are just some guys in wrestling. I don't want to be pointing any fingers and be like, "Oh, you're a complainer." Blah blah. blah. Well, there are some guys that just seem like. That's they they, they, like, they like to complain, you know. Which that's all walks of life, but wrestlers yeah. just happen to get microphones put in front of their faces more often yeah. than everybody. I I think another thing too, as far as uh you know working hard in pro wrestling goes, I mean you're you're in control of someone else for a large portion of it, you know. Um, so if I'm wrestling somebody, I want to be able to trust that they can you know do the moves correctly, that they're in good shape. That I'm not, they're not putting me in danger um, because of their lack of effort, you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like so, like you said, pretty much nothing came. Like, where was that? Was there ever a moment where you were thinking either, "Oh man, I got this. It's in the bag. I'm getting signed," or, or "Oh man, I, I'm horrible at this. I need to go home and just bury my head forever." Or was it just? I'm here. I'm gonna have fun for a week. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, uh, oh well. 
it, it was more of the second one, more of the middle one. Like, uh, oh, damn it, it's never going to happen. I'm going to go home and bury my head. Then, uh, then it was either of the other two. Uh, so, yeah, um, I was going to say something. I lost, completely lost my uh, train of thought. Uh, so, so one other thing I wanted to bring up from your wrestling mm-hmm. past, and this is probably, like, I'm going to ask this, and I realize more than likely this is a totally, like, outdated thought of mind in pro wrestlers, but did you ever run into anyone on, on the indies who was like, oh, this guy has a shooter background, he's going to hurt me, or by that point has everyone kind of figured out, we're here working together, just because this guy can, you know, bend me into a pretzel doesn't mean he's going to to prove himself, you know? Yeah, no, I, I never ran into that. Um, the school I was at, Devon Dudley would come to a lot. Uh, this is before he has, I mean, he has a place now in, in, uh, the Orlando area, but before that he would, he was at the school that, uh, I would be at and we'd always like, you know, he would challenge me and we'd have amateur wrestling or like submission matches. So, uh, you know, it was almost like the, the opposite attitude, you know, plus, I mean, MMA is cool now. It's a cool thing. So guys kind of want to be involved in it a little bit more. Uh, you know, so the, the wrestlers that I'd meet that, you know, either thought I could handle myself or whatnot, they, you know, they were kind of excited about it a little bit. Now, uh, being located in Rhode Island and not Florida, like I thought, since I'm an idiot, um, uh-huh. like, uh, there, there's like, so I think there's like, it's not a lot of indie stuff in Rhode Island, but there's a little bit, I would imagine. Uh, and either way, you're in the Northeast, so it's, not like you're too far away from anything. Yeah. Like, uh, like if you ever thought about, oh man, like you said, you only have so many MMA fights left. Uh, let's say down the line, you're not doing the MMA thing. Would you ever consider uh-huh. doing indie stuff again, or is that just that's behind you? No, uh, I for sure. Well, you know, it depends. Like what you're talking about, indie stuff. I mean, if if uh, it's with a promise of. Um, you know, something in the near future that would that would be you know a bigger opportunity than sure. I would do a few indie matches, but um, at this point, you know, I'm not I'm not looking forward to going to a high school gymnasium and you know doing put myself in danger for 15 minutes and probably not getting paid. So yeah, well, I just I find the irony an independent professional wrestler to be hilarious since 80 percent of the time, like you said, promoters are looking for every way they can to not pay you. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, really, if you're doing professional wrestling, it's either, I mean, you'd love it in some way or another. I mean, unless you're in the WWE level and you're just doing it for money, which I can't imagine even those guys are, uh, you know, don't have some form of love for it. Yeah, like, uh, like you always hear the complaints, oh, the, the big football players down in developmental who don't love it. Well, if they, I, I imagine, like, they, they aren't the hardcore, hardcore fans, but I imagine you have to at least enjoy what you're doing to put up with, you know, wrestling training and being on the road, or else you'd be, you'd be you wanted, out pretty quick. Yeah, you just want to be doing it. I mean, there's so many other options that you have uh, in life. I mean, you, and to end up in pro wrestling, it's not like it's, you know, it's not like something that just chooses you for the most part. I mean, unless you're unless you're a giant, literally born a giant, <laughs> then you can kind of kind of funnels you towards that. But other than that, I mean, you kind of have to search it out. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's harder now, but yeah, there. At least, I mean, it's easier now since like there's a wrestling school every five feet. But yeah, mm-hmm. it's not it's not like you know when you're looking up colleges, getting out of school, you have like these list of pro wrestling vocational schools. Yeah. Comes from. They're not, your guidance counselor is not handing you pamphlets uh, for various pro wrestling schools around the country. Although I wish they would have. That would have been. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, yeah, it would have. It would have been fun at least. Uh, so we were talking about guys you dug in NXT earlier. Like, what else are you watching nowadays? Like, is it just WWE stuff, or do you check out other other groups? No, I watch a lot of. Um, yeah, I mean, I watch WWE stuff every week. Um, I'll watch some TNA stuff here and there. I was watching it a little more consistently uh, after the Bully Ray turn, but the past few weeks haven't been too hot. So uh, I've, been, you know, I've been keeping up with it but not following it religiously. Um, Ring of Honor I watch because uh, you watch it on the internet. And uh, I watch a lot of Japanese stuff too. 
So like who who like what wrestlers are you digging from each group? You mentioned Bully Ray, who like I think everyone can agree is having like his career run right now. Yeah. Like any forty something year old guy who can look like that and then go out and perform like that should be applauded. Yeah. Uh, but who who else are you digging? Like between Ring of Honor and the, the Japanese stuff and everything. Um, I, I mean. The Briscoe brothers are pretty good, damn good, <laughs> in my opinion. I really like watching them. Uh, if I had to pick somebody uh, in the U.S., as far as like Japan um, or Mexico goes, I don't. I don't really follow a lot of lucha libre, but uh, Japanese wrestling. Um, I mean, I've been watching a lot of New Japan just because it's the most easily accessible. Uh, you know, but I also keep up with All Japan and and Noah as well. Um, you know, Go Shiozaki. Uh, Kazi, uh, Okada, you know, there's there's a lot of guys. Uh, I try to mostly watch the the guys that are like younger or starting out, uh, or you know, in the prime of their careers. Uh, did you happen to see the Kabashi retirement match yet, by chance? I watched almost up until the end. I think it was right by the end. And I was starting to fall asleep, so I so I shut it off. Yeah, like I haven't gotten to see it. Like, oh I was, yeah, I was listening to Meltzer talk about it, and I'm like, I need to, like, I wasn't like, like Kabashi was awesome, but that was also a period I would like, you know, in, in like high school and stuff, I wasn't seeking out a lot of Japanese wrestling, so and like Kabashi has so much great stuff that it's like, like especially you know having a job and having life, it's hard to take the time to. I'm going to watch all this great Kinta Kabashi stuff, but yeah, it's something I'm really interested in. So I imagine it was awesome. It wasn't. Uh, it was about what I expected. He didn't. Um, I mean, he came in, did some spots. He, he actually took a couple bumps too. Uh, but you know, there was a lot of other stars in that match too. You also had uh, Kensuke Sasaki, uh, Great Muta was in there. Um, you know, Go Shizaki was there. Kenta. He, he had a number of guys. So everybody uh, got a little bit of action in there. But I think the match is thirty-five minutes long, or maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe not. I thought it was close to a half hour long, so uh, you know it's worth a watch. I wouldn't watch it over and over again, but it's worth it to see at least once. And, and like you brought up the Briscoes, and like I, a lot of people love the Briscoes. I love the Briscoes as well because they seem like there's no act going on there. Yeah, like it's straight up. That's that's Jay and Mark away from yeah. the ring. That's what you get. Like they're almost like redneck uh, Diaz brothers in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a way, although. Uh, if you've been following this deal with uh, Jay Briscoe and the remarks he made on Twitter, uh, he, his his retraction statement or apology or whatever, he said that he plays a character. So I thought that was a uh, that, that was weird. Pretty, yeah. I mean, what else is he gonna say? You know, like <laughs> I just find it weird that he's like, oh yeah, my character doesn't like the gays, but I yeah, love them. Yeah. Like I, well, just, I, guess I it's oh, easier no. than him saying it for himself. You know. Yeah, like I just can't imagine any scenario in Ring of Honor where like, okay, this week, Jay, we really need you to, you know, to cut down the games. Okay, you have to. This is this is what we need you to do. Okay, Jay, five, four, three, and yeah. so I don't know, but yeah, like uh, like you brought up New Japan. I think they're having like, like I haven't been a big uh, pro racing fan in the in like the past decade, but like I'm really the New Japan right now mm. just because it seems like you said it's accessible. To yeah. like the language thing has always thrown me off. Like it's hard for me to, to watch Japanese wrestling with, you know, the commentary I can't understand, and and, and promos that I, I don't speak Japanese, so I can't understand a lot. As great as some of them are with the uh, inflection and the and such, but uh, but like New Japan seems very much like not WWE, but it's like it's flashier than most Japanese. Well stuff. Have you watched, uh, have you seen any new, uh, I'm sorry, not New Japan, All Japan? I have, no, I, I, I they're, really they're more, Go ahead. They're more uh, WWE-ish than uh, New Japan is. As far as, they run like a lot of angles. Uh, they, they were really running a lot of angles for a while. They were really like a sports entertainment company. They're like more sports entertainment than New Japan is. Or um, are you familiar with DDT? Oh, DDT is amazing. Like, uh, I loved the run. They were the one Japanese company I could watch on a consist- consistent basis because it was so ridiculous. Yeah. Like, like, when Mikami's Ladder was, like, the Iron Man champion uh-huh. or whatever. Yeah, they do a lot of cool stuff. I just watched their, or parts of their last show. They just had the, like, a reverse, 
battle <laughs> what's it no it was a ladder battle royal so there were uh like four or five contracts above the ring um but you, you didn't know the wrestlers didn't know what was in them and um then you could also win in the actual battle royal so it was quite an interesting match like do you, have you gotten a chance to watch like any like the really 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 tiny japanese indies that just pop up on youtube every now and again like the ones uh, that are just really really weird no i try not to <laughs> <laughs> like i was like uh i was I watching, avoid them. like i was watching one it was i think the promotion's called something like 666 or something horrible yeah, yeah there, there is there's like freedom 666 i don't know if they're two different companies or the same one it was something like that. I know, I like six 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 might be a deathmatch company, or I might be thinking of somebody else. But they ran like a Bruce Lee match, where uh, like he looked like I think it might have been like Kota Ibushi doing some freelance stuff as yeah. Bruce Lee against like a bunch of different Bruce Lee movie villains. And uh-huh. I'm just thinking, this is insane. This is happening in front of me on the computer. Uh, but something else from DDT I love is like those campsite matches they do, where they yeah. just fight outside and shoot bottle rockets at each other and. Like, uh, I think they did one in an amusement park last year where someone got strapped into a, one of those deals that goes up really high really fast. And Yeah. Well, years back, I remember they uh, – I don't know. It might have been FMW had matches that were in, like, apartment buildings or or something along those lines. Yeah, I think they did, like, a house match or something. I don't know. But yeah. I, I, I thought you were going to allude to when I brought up, like, uh, Bottle Rockets, the uh, infamous anal rocket match. That was on like VHS here in America for a while, like like some company. Uh, I think Dan Lebransky from the Law did commentary for it. Oh really? Yeah, it's like uh, I forget who was in the match, but the loser had to like shove a bottle rocket up his rectum and <laughs> light it. And uh, Japanese wrestling, uh, but yeah, That's great. like like brought up like Okada's the man and uh, Tanahashi's great and uh, yeah, just. I, I love the fact that New Japan's even made, like, Lance Archer kind of interesting. Yeah, they're do, they're doing a really good job, and their booking's logical. They have uh, some really good wrestlers, and there's a lot of different styles that you get to see. I mean, you get to see the juniors. Um, you get to see, you know, guys like Minoru Suzuki or uh, Katsuyori Shibata or Sakuraba who have, like, a, a shoot background. And then, you know, you also have guys like Tanahashi who, and Okada who are, like, real wrestlers you know they're they're real pro wrestlers i guess i should have thrown nakamura into that other mix with um the shooter guys too although his style is kind of uh blending back more towards wrestling based i guess not sure yeah um have have you seen the lineup for the best the super juniors by the way the the guys that are in it It yeah 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 i've kind of uh i haven't been watching as much of that as i used to um I think as I get older, uh, I like watch it a little bit more for the storytelling aspect of a match, and maybe less for like the the actual wrestling ability of the guys. And I feel like that a lot of time the heavyweights uh, tell a better story. Yeah, well, I mean, they have to because when you're when you're a big dude, two sixty, two seventy, whatever, some of those guys are. Some of them aren't so big, but some of them <clears> are carrying a lot of weight. You can't be flying around like a like a ricochet or an Adrian Neville all the, yeah. the freaking time. So, uh, but, uh, yeah, that's new, new Japan's awesome. I, I should probably check out some all Japan. Like when I was talking about new Japan being more accessible to Americans, I mean, like it looks prettier. Like that, the Tokyo <laughs> oh, yeah, Dome yeah, for show, sure, yeah. like, yeah, the Tokyo Dome show, like, I don't know what it was. It was, it was like a really good show. It wasn't the most amazing show in the world, but it was a really good show, but it was easy for me to sit through because it looked pretty and it had lights and flashing colors and I don't know, maybe I'm just a dumb American, but uh. yeah, it's definitely better than seeing, I mean, you'll still see like all Japan shows that are in gymnasiums. And I mean, you know, uh, new Japan's running shows like that too. I guess you probably just don't see them as often. Yeah. Like, uh, I, I mean, they do have bigger uh, fan base too, but yeah, like I know new Japan still runs like Korokan hall, which I guess you can't really do anything to that building because every show there seems to be same no matter who runs it but uh but yeah then they run like like the dome or a bigger stadium and it looks it looks like a rock concert you know especially uh-huh. when guys are having bands play them to the ring yeah yeah and, 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 like for 10 minutes on a seven hour show 
uh, what have you. But uh, yeah, man, uh, I, I guess we can. Uh, I guess we can go ahead and uh, wrap this up. This has been a lot of fun, man. Uh, a lot of fun. If there's uh, if there's anything you want to say to close it out, whether it be plugs or just anything you want to get off your mind, or just now's the floor. Uh, there was something I was gonna start plugging in uh, interviews that they didn't ask me to plug it, but I can't remember what it was. Oh yeah, well one thing I can plug is TastyBurgerUSA.com. You should check out their website. I just completed the Tasty Burger Challenge uh, here in Boston, Massachusetts. So I'd like to give a shout out to Tasty Burger and a shout out to my cats, Maddie and Mr. <laughs> Waffles, if they're listening. Uh, I did this for you guys. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much, man. It was a pleasure. It was a blast. And uh, for sure. Uh, thank you so much once again. Uh, and no problem. And after the music you're hearing right now plays, outro, blah, blah, blah. That's it for the podcast. Once again, big thanks to Filthy Tom Lawler. Uh, check out his cats. I'm sure there are photos of them somewhere online sure they're adorable little buggers uh, before we go some things you should follow check out listen to watch subscribe blah 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 um i'm on twitter personally at not that tom green i live tweet raw every monday i tweet tweet bad jokes i do all sorts of lovely things on there so check that out at not that tom green you can also find out who the guests are on this show first if you subscribe not subscribe follow Russell Folks on Twitter at Russell Folks, Facebook.com slash Russell Folks. I like it there. Be a Russell Folk with you, with me, with Tom Lawler, with uh, various funny people, with uh, everyone. Let's just be Russell Folks together. Um, and make sure, once again, if you're on iTunes, if you're not on iTunes, get on iTunes. If you are on iTunes, make sure to review and rate this podcast five stars and get us higher in the algorithm. Thank you, McBobber. Also, I have a web series that I work on. Joe Gagne's Fun Time Pro Wrestling Arcade. Obviously, I'm not Joe Gagne, but I work on it. I do the editing and some of the social media and all that fun stuff. Make sure to check that out. YouTube.com slash Mike and Tom present all 42 episodes of the wildly popular video gaming series about retro video games and how much most of them suck. And once again, like I mentioned at the beginning of the show, this Sunday afternoon, 4 p.m. bell time, Villa Park, Illinois, BWAA, Numbers Game 3.0. I will be doing commentary for the DVD and MP4 download release. It's a series of trios matches. The winners go on to a doors, ladders, and chairs match for the circuit championship of BWAA. It will be freaking insane. People will be falling off ladders and going through doors. This will be crazy. BWAAWrestling.com. Follow them, follow them on Twitter at BWAA. I am gone for another week. I will be back next week, either Wednesday or Thursday. I'm not so reliable, but I'm working on it. I love all of you. Y'all have a great day. Mwah. So on, so forth. Oh.